I'm happy to be able to speak with you. I feel like I've been trying to speak to you for about a, almost a year now, if not the entirety of 2021. Yes, it has been a minute, but I'm glad we're able to, things have slowed down enough and we're able to chat this week. Yeah. And then on top of that, you're going to be my last, possibly my last interview of 2021. So congratulations. You get the end yeah. of the year with that. That's right. Yeah. All right. So the purpose of the Expanding Our Roots interview series is just to give you an opportunity to share your story, share your work with the community, and to be part of this ongoing project that 821 is doing to kind of reshape how we in Louisiana see Louisiana and how people on the outside see Louisiana. Because oftentimes you hear a lot of people talk about Louisiana being this place that everybody's leaving or a place where bad things are happening but there's not a lot of movement to stop those things from happening. And the whole purpose of this series is just to show that we have activists, we have change makers, we have change seekers, we have diversity, we have so much richness in this community that we should really kind of appreciate and not take for granted. And that's the whole purpose of it. I wanna first ask specifically, how did we first connect? Because a lot of people I've interviewed, some of them I, my interview is the first time I've talked to them. And other times I've known them for a while. So the interview is just like a conversation. So how, do you remember how we first connected? Okay. I remember the first time we connected was through the Boundaries Youth Coalition. And I think you at the time had started 821 Project. And I was at the time facilitating for Dialogue on Race, which I'm still a facilitator for. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, someone with Baton Rouge Youth Coalition attempted to bring us together. I mean, we did meet a few times, but I, I remember that was our first way that we met. It was about four years ago. And I think that it was specifically for that project and it didn't work out, but I think that we have kind of known each other since then. Yes, yes. Yeah. We keep coming, kind of orbiting by each other. But never actually talking to each other until now. Well, and we facilitated this summer together. Yes, until, yeah, until that, that's what I was going to say. Like, like we had known, it's kind of like, you know someone and you know of someone. And yeah. I think that we've known of, of each other. And then we worked together with Dialogue on Race, which was actually my first, you were my first co-facilitator with Dialogue on Race. Yes, and I had a great experience facilitating with you. The whole idea of expanding our roots to the world comes from this idea that we have some place that we are rooted in or some or some experience we're deeply rooted in. So the whole purpose of that is to take what we're deeply rooted in or where we're coming from and share our experiences and our lessons out to the world. So I wanted to ask you as a first official question of the conversation, where are you from and where are you coming from? I am from Baton Rouge. I was born here. I lived here until I was in about fourth grade, fifth grade. And then my family moved to Hammond about you know, 50 miles east of Baton Rouge. And it's funny because I stayed in Hammond from for middle school and half of high school. And then I went to Louisiana school in Natchitoches, which is a residential, a public residential uh, high school. And then um, while I was there, my mom moved back to Baton Rouge. So I consider myself from Baton Rouge, though most people in Baton Rouge, if I say I'm from Baton Rouge, their follow-up question is, where'd you go to high school? I did not go to high school here, but I feel like zero to 10, those are pretty pivotal years. So I claim Baton Rouge. I think that, you know, this is, this is still a place that you have roots in. You know, I've interviewed plenty of people who are not from America, but their roots are in Baton Rouge because they've been so deeply connected to the community. So I think that counts. Yes, absolutely. So even though you spent a lot of your life across the state, you still have experiences with being a Louisiana. So I want I wanted to I want to know specifically what it was like growing up in these different places, it's like growing up in Hammond and then and in Baton Rouge and then going to school in Natchitoches. Interesting, honestly. So um, as I said, I was born in Baton Rouge and I lived here until I was about ten. My parents got divorced when I was three, and and that really changed a lot for our family, especially financially. We had been going, my sister and I have an older sister. She and I were going to private school in Baton Rouge. This is in the early nineties. And at the time, the school system here in Baton Rouge was more racially segregated then than it is now. At the time we were still under like a court 
longest standing court uh, decree to desegregate, the only one in the country, I believe, longest standing one. And so I was at a private school in Baton Rouge, which was basically all white. And then when I was in second grade, you know, my family just financially didn't make sense anymore. And so we went to public school. That for me, I mean, talking about roots, that for me really was a very foundational experience. When my parents got divorced, my mom went back to school and went into teaching. And so she was teaching in public schools. I was a student at public school and going from a pretty affluent private white school to a predominantly black public school in Baton Rouge was just very eye-opening. I feel like a lot of times Baton Rouge is kind of described as this, you know, it's like a tale of two cities. There's just such a stark contrast between um, different parts of the city. And as a child, I really lived in both those worlds when I was like six, seven, eight, nine years old. So I was in at LaSalle public school here in Baton Rouge. I was there in um, second and third grade. And by the time I was in fourth grade, my mom had gotten a job at Southeastern University in Hammond. So she moved to Hammond and I, my parents, frankly, just didn't want me in public school anymore. And I can talk a bit more about that too. Socially, it was fine. Public school, like I got along with other kids and everything. Academically, it was really hard. I think for my mom, especially as someone who um, really cared about education, I just, what was being offered at La Salle at the time was not totally up to par. My, when I got there in second grade, my second grade teacher made an informal arrangement with a third grade teacher. And I was able to attend third grade every day for second grade. So I would go to the second grade class, check in. Then I would go over to, her name was Miss Mims and I adored her. Went to Miss Mims class and spent the day with her third grade class. And then at the end of that year, my third grade teacher, Miss Mims tried to make the same arrangement with a fourth grade teacher. Understandably, the fourth grade teacher was like, um, no, I have enough kids in my class. And So I just repeated third grade. So I did second, skipped second grade and repeated third grade, Uh, did it twice. And it just, you know, as it sounds like that just didn't work. And so my mom had gotten transfer or gotten the job opportunity and Hammond moved to Hammond and I didn't get into the private school there. And so my parents put me back into private school here in Baton Rouge and I commuted. I will say As a fourth grader, going back to private school after being in public school for two years here, and also just that by that point, my family, I mean, I I feel like we had just totally changed classes. We were working class family, you know, my parents were really struggling to make ends meet. And so when I returned to that private school, it was with very different take on things. It was a very foundational experience, especially because my family's like our financial situation had changed. And so experiencing poverty firsthand, but also being in a setting of other students that were experiencing poverty, the vast majority of them. I mean, one, one thing that I remember going from public school to, or going from private school to public school, one, some things that I remember at the beginning of that second grade year is like, First of all, having to go shopping for um, school supplies, like at my private school, the first day of school, you go in, everything's set out on your desk, there's a label on your desk. And then for the public school, it was like, we got a list and we had to go pick out our own stuff. It was just so different to me. And I remember asking my mom about it and she told me about public school funding and just, you know, and, and the other thing is I remember this was very, I remember this so clearly the first day of school at Uh, when I went to LaSalle at the public school, I remember them calling names on the roster. And as a seven-year-old, like kids that were supposed to be in my class were not there. And, um, and I was like worried, like, I was like, where are they? I mean, who would miss your first day of class? And I remember talking to my mom about it. And she's like, you know, a lot of your classmates have a lot of flux, experience a lot of change. They might be moving a lot. And in some ways that was a really almost like foreshadowing message from her, because then that was my experience from there on was a lot of moving. And, and, but I, yeah, I remember in first grade when I was at the private school, there was one student who left mid-year and she, you know, like we threw a party for her 
um, or her parents got transferred. She moved out of state and they threw a party for her. And then I remember when I was in public school, it was like students were leaving the school all the time and there was no going away party. They, there wasn't even like, Hey, today's my last day. You know, a lot of times even they themselves maybe wouldn't have even known that they were going to be transferred to another school. And so just kind of recognizing that aspect of poverty and working class experiences in the United States, just how much flux there is associated with it. I don't know. It was, it was, there was a very stark contrast um, between the two schools. And then I moved to Hammond and in Hammond, Hammond was like, I don't want to hate on Hammond. I did not enjoy living in Hammond. I had some so a solid group of friends, um, but then by high school, when I had the opportunity to go to Louisiana school in Natchitoches, uh, I learned about this public boarding school and I applied and I got in and I was super eager to go. And uh, living in Natchitoches, Natchitoches is a really cute town. That school is a total, I mean, it is just so unique for this state. It has a ways to go in terms of diversity, but it was way more diverse than the public or private schools that I had been in, in elementary or middle school, uh, more of a multicultural experience. I had classmates <clears throat> and sweet mates really, who were born in other countries, other continents. And, um, and so that was a really great experience too. And I'm really close to a lot of my classmates still from Louisiana school. And I feel very committed and connected to that institution still and kind of helping that institution resolve some of its issues. Yeah. And then my, while I was in high school there, my mom had moved back to Baton Rouge. And, um, and so when I graduated, I came back to Baton Rouge having, you know, not much of a community here, but, um, but in some ways it did feel like coming back home, moving back here. I'm hearing from what you talk about is that, you know, when being exposed to life outside of your bubble at a young age is probably very, you know, transformative because a lot of times young people, either they're in a bubble their whole lives or they're exposed to adversity so early or so, or so quickly in their lives cognizant that their reality is not other people's realities. And that kind of transforms how they see the world. Because it's interesting how for you, your parents kind of saw private school as a school that, you know, as having better education, better opportunities. And I had the opposite experience. I was in private school when I was in elementary school. My mom actually had the opposite experience when she was like, not feeling the private school I was going to. So I ended up in public school and that was how I ended up going to McKinley Middle. And then I went to McKinley High because I was a great scholars student. So I was able to go to, to gifted school, gifted, be in the gifted great scholars program at McKinley, even though I lived in North Baton Rouge. So for me, you know, it was just, it was just a very powerful experience to go from a private school that didn't have the best educational outcomes for me. And then to go to a public school where I was able to do visual and performing arts and meet people with diverse backgrounds. And for me, I was able to see diversity within my own community. That for me, I would have to say was very transformative. And I keep using that word a lot, but that's the only word I can use right now with my yeah. booster brain. But, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it was for me being in high school and going to school with Latino, Asian American, Arab students, international students, in my school in the hood, you know, the school with so much history like McKinley High, it really gave me a different understanding of my community because I, unlike you, I was, I spent my entire formative years from birth to 17 living in Baton Rouge. Yeah. And then I left when I turned 17 to go to college in New Orleans, but I spent my first, my grade school years in one place. Yeah. And I will say, um, so when I went to that when I went into public school, when I was in second grade, you know, I did get tested for gifted and I was deemed not gifted. And so I was just, you know, I went to a traditional school and I think, um, I will say when I went to the private school in Hammond, that academically was not impressive to me or my parents. I mean, my, my mom especially was just ecstatic when I, decided to go to pursue and got in and uh, went to Louisiana school because she was overpaying tuition for mediocrity, as she put it. So 
Yeah. Right. But Relatable. yeah. But I feel like there we have obvious clear differences in terms of our pre 18 year old year old life lives. Because yeah. I've lived my, I spent my whole life in one city for 17 years. You lived in different places and I had adverse experiences in private school academically and socially that weren't the same weren't went to public school. But one thing we do have in common are two things. Number one, we are liberal arts majors. I have an international studies degree. I know you have a little uh, poli sci degree from LSU Mm -hmm. and you have some international travel background as well. So I want to ask you about your experiences get going to LSU and getting that poli sci degree. And also I read somewhere, because I do my research, I read that you you were in Spain for a couple of years doing doing a work, doing work there as, was a cultural ambassador? I feel like that's the name. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah. And I will say for me, international travel really started after high school. When I was graduating from Louisiana school, which is a pretty competitive academic environment. um, My senior year, I was like, not about applying to colleges. I applied to a couple Uh, I think I got rejected to some of my top waitlisted, whatever. And I was just, I was like, I need a break anyway. So um, this was in 2007 and I decided to take a gap year pretty early on in my senior year. And as soon as I made that decision, it was just a huge feeling of relief. That summer I spent some time saving money. I really wanted to study abroad or do something abroad, not studying, but I wanted to travel abroad. And during high school, I had taken French and my senior year, I added Spanish. My mom is a, was a French teacher. She speaks French fluently. I grew up around a lot of French. Her family is um, Cajun and my grandfather spoke French. And so uh, I just always took French elementary through 12th grade. And my senior year, I actually needed an extra elective. And I was like, let me just add Spanish. And, and I loved it. And I was able to pick it up really quick and, um, it was way easier for me to pronounce than, and then French. (laughs) And so when I decided to take a gap year, I was like, okay, do I want to go to West Africa? Um, or do I want to go to, um, South America? And I ended up going to South America. So I saved money and I did a volunteer program in Peru Um, And that was a really transformative experience for sure. So that was my first experience traveling abroad. Um, I remember, I mean, I spent months like working at cafes and restaurants in Baton Rouge. I worked at the Tar. I worked all over the place, saving money for that trip. I remember like I had the goal. I set out for the goal. I was so focused on it. Like I literally was counting $1 bills that I got from my tip jar at the sandwich shop where I worked in town. And, um, I was like, Oh, I got to get to 3,500. I I went through a program. And so I had to pay 3,500 to participate in the program. And I just remember stacking that money. And then it was like, I was so focused on the goal. I remember being on the plane, going to Peru and being like, Oh my God, wait, this is kind of insane. Is this insane? (laughs) You know, what am I doing? Like, this is kind of wild. Um, But it was a really great experience for me. Very eye opening. And I will say that the most eye opening part of it is I was one of the only American or I was the only American volunteers Uh, gap years are becoming more popular here, but at the time they were not, they're really popular in the UK and in um, different parts of Europe. And so most of my fellow volunteers in the group were from Europe and hearing their perspective of the United States, um, seeing how Peruvians interacted, made the, you know, distinguish between them as Europeans versus me as an American was really eye-opening. I just, it was like a crash course in um, how in many ways the U.S. is not appreciated in especially uh, Central and South America, for sure. Yeah, I'm thinking about the time that you went. That was like in the late 2000s, early 2010s, I assume. And I know America was not necessarily in a good place with the world at that time. And then also thinking about the history that the U.S. has with Latin America, a lot of people have beef. Yeah. Just to put it plainly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was, it was um, spring 2008 that I was there. And so it was George Bush's last year. Um, It was before Obama was elected. And 
I mean, one thing I remember very specifically is once the group of volunteers, we went to Bolivia um, and we were doing a, a land border crossing and it was basically an oppor- a way to get our visa renewed, our traveler visa renewed. So everybody was like, oh yeah, you can just go to Bolivia for a week and then come back and then you'll have a renewed 90 days to be here in Peru. And so we went and I was like the only one in my group of about five of us that got waved over and told I had to pay like 800 Bolivianos or something. Um, and it was free for everybody else. And I was like, oh, why? <laughs> you know, why do I have to pay? They were like, well, you have to buy a five-year visa. They get to just come in as travelers. And they were like, it's because of policies that the U.S. has for South American travelers. So that was basically what we do. You know, if somebody from Bolivia wants to visit the United States, they have to pay for a visa. They can't just come and visit um, in the same way that we get to travel so freely in most, to most countries. And so that was really, I was like, okay, I, I get that. Sucks for me, but I get that, you know. Um, but it those sorts of things, there were so many little lessons like that during my time there that I just really realized a lot about U.S. policy and the impacts and our reputation. And then, yeah, the next year I went to school and I was pretty quickly drawn to political science because it was just a topic that I was very interested in. I mean, lectures for me was like story time. It was the kind of it was the kind of information that I would spend my free time wanting to read, listen to, watch, absorb in whatever way. And so to me, poli sci felt like a natural fit. I really resonated with with what you were saying, especially considering that as Americans, we don't pay attention to how the world sees this country. And we also think we're such the center of everything that we forget that people don't see us as a center. And on top of that, the, the policies that we put into place for other countries, we don't take into consideration or appreciate just how deeply impactful and maybe even problematic, you may argue, some of these policies are. It's like, we'll treat certain countries a certain way, and then we'll treat other countries the, the exact opposite, especially when it comes, excuse me, when it comes to foreign policy. You know, it's like, one standard we have for one country, we don't have for the other. And I think, um, you know, I traveled a good bit throughout college. I had a job working at a catering company in college and I was not much of a, I don't know. I didn't really party. I was kind of a homebody. I just worked a lot and saved money and I would go on trips in the summer and during breaks and stuff. So had the opportunity to travel abroad a good bit in college. And after college, I did that. Well, actually, it was later, but I, when I taught abroad in Spain, that was a really eye-opening experience for me too. Even though I had traveled to Spain in my role, I um, was what's called a cultural ambassador with the um, education uh, ministry there. And so I taught English lessons, but specifically about culture. And I was placed at a high school. And so the high school students, their language abilities were really impressive And so we were able to go pretty deep and we talked about, I mean, they were really curious about a lot of issues, especially like gun control. That was something we talked about a lot. Um, Reproductive health was something we talked about a lot. They were like, y'all are so prudish and puritanical. I'm like, yeah. Um, But it was, you know, having those dialogues um, with students and with colleagues, because a lot of the people who taught in the English department too were eager to just kind of you know, talk through some of the issues. I mean, it really expanded my understanding of what makes the United States unique, problematic, redeeming in some ways. I mean, there were some things that when I was abroad were really highlighted for me, but there was a lot that I was like, oh, geez, um, it's worse than I even realized before. So one thing I hate is, I don't hate, but one thing I'm not really a fan of is a binary way of thinking. There's good and bad and maybe neutral in every context. You know, I actually went to Europe several times when I was in, you know, when I was in high school and college, I was very blessed to go to Europe a year after you were, you, you were in Peru in the summer of 2009, when I finished middle school, before I went to high school, when I went to Italy with my middle school and my family, and that was really amazing. And then I, I was a people to people ambassador and I went to Europe when I graduated high school or I went to college and those trips were amazing they were beautiful but I 
oftentimes realized how much I had romanticized other countries because I had been fed this belief that, oh, America is not that great of a country. Everybody else is better. But I was, I'm like, not really. But then, because there are some things I like and some things I don't, but it wasn't until I studied abroad at, from, at the University of New Orleans, did a study abroad five-week program in France that I realized that even if places are different, human beings are the same. Like we've, our cultures are different, our identity identities are different, but our experience as being human beings are the same and universal. And once I interpreted and learned to interpret people and culture through this idea that our cultural differences are different, but our existence as humans are the same, it helped me to appreciate the differences in culture and differences in, 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 in how we interact with each other. Not to say that policies are every that of a policy is problematic. It should stay on the books because, oh, that's just how things are done here. But more so, for me, travel made me more curious about the world as opposed to critical. Just yeah. Just like, oh, really yeah. Critical. And I think if you ever travel along someone who is like, oh, that's weird. Or I don't like that all the time. It, it really highlights that. I definitely think when I travel, I think part of why I really enjoy traveling is, you know, I appreciate, I'm curious and I appreciate the differences and, but also recognizing that there's these kind of universal truths that are underneath all of them. Yeah. It's worse to travel with someone who is very close-minded. Like I remember when I did people, with people, I was just happy to be there. You know, I was happy to be in these countries and happy to be traveling. And my expectation was to do something I could not do in my own community. So like why and eat different foods. But yeah. some of the people I traveled with, they wanted America everywhere they went. So there would be times where they would, I would have, you know, we would have dinner or lunch at a restaurant. We would eat like German food, Belgian food. Dutch food, French food, people are like, I don't want that. I want McDonald's. I want this, like the stereotypical American. And I was like, well, can I have that? Because that was good. I really like that, that escargot. I, I really like those Belgian fries. I want that. Or I like that, that pasta. Give me that. I love it. I Because I just, I embraced the world as it was and not as what I wanted it to be and not try to compare it to American culture. And I, now that I'm older, I feel like if I went, if I traveled internationally now, I would, I would mark it. Like I would definitely be in my bag, you know, traveling. Cause I would be I'm much more mature and grounded now to be able to fully experience this, experience the places that I'd be in. So fast forward, okay. you travel, you're in Spain and now you're in Baton Rouge. Like you, 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 you may not have lived your whole life in Baton Rouge, but you're building a professional and social justice identity for yourself in Baton Rouge. How did that journey start for you? And walk me through your journey of going from your start in the, in the, just, in the community work you're doing in Baton Rouge to now being in the role that you're in with Serve Louisiana. I mean, I think my experience doing that volunteer program in Peru was really fundamental because I just, when I was there, I had the realization, which I think now is there's a lot of think pieces that say the same thing and really highlight it. But I was like, why am I here? Like, I don't know anything. I'm just from the United States. Um, you know, I'm 18. Like what, what do I bring to this kindergarten class? And so when I came back, I was like, Oh, I, I bet I could do some stuff in my hometown. And I'd seen that quote, you know, do what you can where you are with what you have. And so, um, I started tutoring with a few local organizations and just started picking up volunteer opportunities around um, while I was in school. And that was really, you know, that was kind of the start of it for me was taking advantage of volunteer opportunities in different areas. Um, and then when I graduated from college, I graduated in December of 2011 and that spring semester, I didn't have anything outside of the service industry lined up. Um, the job market was really tough at the time. And yeah, I was like working at a cafe. I was picking up catering gigs and I had a professor email me an AmeriCorps opportunity that was actually based out of Mississippi. And I thought the position sounded cool, but I was like, I do not want to move to Mississippi. Let me see if there's something similar here. And so I did a search and I found um, 
what was then called Louisiana Delta Service Corps, now known as Serve Louisiana. And there were all these opportunities with different organizations in town. And I was just so excited even looking at the website. And so I completed an application and submitted it. And, um, and so my service term, I worked with an organization called Slow Food Baton Rouge doing uh, school and community garden work. And I had a positive experience with doing that work. I met a ton of really great mentors that year. I had a lot of people take me under their wing and kind of usher me into community work. And in addition to that, just the Serve Louisiana programming, getting together with the other members who had gotten positions at other uh, nonprofits in the area. We did these monthly team meetings and I was just exposed to all these different things that were happening in Baton Rouge to address all these issues. The thing that was really interesting to me at the time is like I had graduated as a political science, um, you know, student. And so I was well aware of a lot of the problems, but I wasn't totally I was not at all tapped into the vast network of grassroots organizations and folks who were doing really impressive, impactful, effective work to address some of the issues and for me, my Serve Louisiana term as a core member, like all of that really started connecting. Um, that was when I first participated in Dialogue on Race was when I was a core member. So that was 2012. Um, and I got trained to be a facilitator that summer. And I was also introduced to Together Baton Rouge uh, during that service term, an organization that I still work very closely with. And so, yeah, that was a my service term was like, just a really foundational stepping stone. I went on to have a couple other jobs and went away. And then basically I got it invited to apply to join the staff at Serve Louisiana. And I was really excited to do that. And so I've been on staff now for almost seven years and I'm currently the program director. And what type of work do you do as the program director of of Serve Louisiana? The way our program works is we partner emerging leaders with local organizations for a paid 11 month um, service opportunity. All of our core members do what's called capacity building work. So they're mostly working behind the scenes, helping the organization run more efficiently um, or serve more clients. Our members serve in a wide variety of fields. So we have core members who do work in the environmental field, um, healthcare access, food access, uh, education, youth development, all sorts of different areas. And so as program director, uh, I help recruit our applicants and our core members. And everybody starts at the same time. So our program goes September 1st to July 31st. And so my focus is really making sure that every single member has a really engaging service term where they feel invested in both by their partner organization, but also serve Louisiana. So just trying to connect them with as many opportunities as I can for them to learn about issues in their field and kind of get them well equipped so that they're well positioned to step into whatever they, it is that they want to do next. Um, and we have core members that head head out in lots of different directions, uh, but the vast majority of them do stay doing community work. So to me, developing them as leaders and making sure that by the end of their service term, they not only understand the issues, but really understand who some of the major players are in our communities doing this work. I mean, to me, that's like developing them is way more impactful than anything. Like that is the impact. That's way more than ever anything I can do on my own is if they're well-informed, well-positioned, well-connected and supported to kind of launch in whatever direction, whatever, to take on whatever issues most important to them. I mean, then I feel like I've done a good job. Two questions. Um, Question number one is, what do you define as leadership development? Because it's like, there's so many terms I hear that that are very general terms, but they're very unique in the definition, depending on who you ask. So so what would you consider to be um, leadership development? Well, so I would say a leader, first of all, is um, to be a leader, you have to have followers. I think leadership development is 
about making sure they have the skills to be able to get something done, to understand a problem, research it, come up with a plan to address it, and then go after it and get it done. Um, a lot of my understanding of leadership development comes from Together Baton Rouge, which is all about leadership development. It's all about organizing and really organizing is about developing folks so that they, you know, can get up and talk in front of a city council or understand how to, um, how to make an impact, how to, you know, make sure that their programming gets in front of the right clients or whoever would benefit most from it. And so it's tailored for sure. But I think, you know, when we're looking for core members, I'm definitely looking for, first of all, I am looking for people from Louisiana who are invested in Louisiana. We invest so much in our core members that, um, you know, I want a lot of that knowledge to stay here. No shade to people who are like, I got to get out of Louisiana and they want to move somewhere else. I totally get that. But, um, you know, we've had a really different shift in our core members who we recruit and retain as core members. Um, when I was a core member, the vast majority of the team in New Orleans was from out of state. And so we're just really working hard to shift that ratio. And this year we have more members from Louisiana, from New Orleans. And I think that really makes a difference to our program for sure, but also to the members themselves. And as I'm hearing you talk about like this leadership development, I'm also thinking about another question, the question that I wanted to ask you, which was relevant to this idea of your past informing your present, you know, because you've done a lot of travel internationally. You've learned a lot about yourself and your identity, you know, internet traveling internationally, but also your upbringing and the different experiences that you had living in different places and going to school in different places. So I guess the question I have specifically is when you think about the type of leadership development that you want to engage in as program director, how do your past experiences, domestic and international, kind of shape that approach that you have and maybe even the definition i think in terms of my experiences traveling living other places in my own development i think one way that it's really influenced how i do the work at program as program director at serve louisiana to me it's just paramount developing local talent we have so many extraordinary people here who just need an opportunity to grow and learn and sometimes make mistakes. And that's what I really cherish about service terms is it's designed to be a learning opportunity. And so we just try to make it as rich of a learning opportunity as possible because I really do think that's the only pathway forward is if people from within the community have had the opportunities to attend trainings and workshops and sit in meetings and network and, and to do all that stuff while getting paid, earning money to go back to school or pay off student loans, having health insurance while they're doing it. Um, you know, I, I just think that's a great way to go about it in terms of addressing any issues. I ask that question because I feel like it's important to know that everything is connected. I feel like your entry into the work in the community was very similar to mine, except I didn't think that I could make a difference in my community because I didn't think that my community was a place for me. And then it was ironically through travel and living in other places in the country, like in New England, that I realized that I have way too many gifts to be selfish with them. You know, I have way too many. I, I, I'm an introvert who loves bringing people together. And I feel like you know, as it relates to the work I do with A21, my goal was to give people a space to feel as though they belong in their community because I didn't feel like I belong. And so when I came to do the work in the community, I didn't feel as though there were other organizations that were actively working to create universal belongingness. There was this idea of like, well, we're gonna only work with these people or those people or the people in our silo. And I wanted to work with everybody. And that came from my experiences with, you know, being, you know, bullied and stigmatized as a young person. We came through traveling internationally and traveling yeah. to different parts of the country and just meeting diverse people. 
And by way of having those experiences, I, I wanted to create the type of spaces that I felt most at home at, spaces that were diverse, spaces that were authentic, spaces that were rooted in self-expression, but also rooted in accumulating knowledge just for the sake of understanding ourselves and where we are in the world, which is why a lot of 821's programs are learning and interacting and engaging and, and expressing oneself, as opposed to just me simply doing a speaker panel or workshop every every other day, you know, talking at people. You did mention specifically that you want to develop people who are rooted in this community, not just people who are gonna, you know, hit it and quit it, but people that are gonna be in Louisiana to build and nurture Louisiana. I don't necessarily see that happening in the broader community. What I often feel is happening is there's a lot of Louisiana um, maybe not a lot, I want to generalize, but there's a great number of people in Louisiana who are leaving Louisiana, almost like a little brain drain, where people are calling it quits once they get their high school diploma and settling elsewhere in the country. Or you have people who are doing community change work who are, you know, retiring their cape and moving and taking their work in other places. And so I, when I think about these you know, just like this year alone, there have been so many people who have been in this community for decades who have moved to other regions or other states. Even people now, as we speak, are probably considering leaving Baton Rouge or Southeast Louisiana. So I guess the question I have for you specifically is, is as you're trying to develop people in the community to be rooted in the community, in what ways are you try, are, do you feel like we need to confront this, I would have to say, brain drain or even spirit drain is happening in Louisiana where people are leaving and going in other places as opposed to finding ways to be deeply connected into their community and maybe making it better and organizing within their community. I'll, I'll talk from my own experience. I feel deeply connected in Baton Rouge and also I feel very resentful of Baton Rouge because at the end of the day, I this is not the kind of city I want to live in. I mean, there's just limited extracurricular opportunities, the traffic, the way everything's designed. I mean, I like where I live in town. I like being able to walk places and stuff, but the people and my connections is really what keeps me here. And my community work is what keeps me here. Because if it weren't for that, I would be leaving very quick um, and going somewhere where there's just more to do. I mean, I really enjoy community work. And also this is something that I, you know, when I lived in Spain, something that was really highlighted for me was Americans obsession with work and our, how closely our identity is tied to work. That is something that is in some ways unique to American culture. Like it definitely exists everywhere and it's a symptom of capitalism or it works hand in hand with capitalism for sure. I mean, even linguistically, like in Spanish, you don't ask people, oh, what do you do when you first meet them? Like you don't ask them immediately what their job is, you know, it's like, oh, what are your interests? It's not like, where do you work? Who's your paycheck from? But my connections and my community work definitely keep me here, but it's like, I want so many other things for Baton Rouge. I just want it to be the kind of place where people want to live, frankly. Yeah. And I don't know that it is that right now. And, and I think for us to be able to keep people and for us to prevent brain drain and spirit drain, as you put it, it's like we, things have to change and they have to change quick. And it's not just about job opportunities. It's like, it's about Baton Rouge being the kind of city that, where there's things to see and do that restore your spirit really, you know, and it's not a one-off where it's like really accessible and it's accessible to everybody. I think we've made huge strides in the past 10, 15 years. There are things that Baton Rouge have that we have here that are incredible. We have a great library system. We have amazing parks, but there's just such a long way to go. I mean, every time I go and visit another city where there's just fun recreational places. There's, you know, things to see and do. There's equity and access. I'm like jealous, <laughs> frankly, but these are things that we're working on. And I also think it's important to know that 
there are, that the binary doesn't adequately represent our emotions either. It's like we can love a community and also feel like it is not exactly where we want it to be. Right. Like, it, like I think Baton Rouge is a place that I, when I was younger, I used to hate it. Yeah. And I don't hate it anymore, but I also am not complacent with what things are like now. And yeah. I do, and the reason why I have not left was because I feel like there's just way too much that I can do yeah. before I throw in the towel. You know, there's just, because yeah. I feel as though the type of spaces that I create and so many other people create, because I'm not unique in terms of creating spaces. There are so many people who did it before me. They're doing it while I'm doing it and will probably do it after me. You know, creating spaces, you know, I think about the fact that if everybody leaves and take their they take their creativity and their and their their journeys with them, their stories with them, their perspectives, their ideas with them. And then there's like this negative feedback cycle where Baton Rouge continues to be a place that either doesn't grow or grows extremely slowly because yeah. there's nothing to catalyze the growth. All the catalysts are going to places where they blend in. And in yeah. Baton Rouge, yeah. it's easy to not blend in because if you're unique and different, then you don't blend in with everybody else. But sometimes being the vanguard or being the only person doing a certain thing is exhausting. So also I supporting, I, I really resonated with what you were saying about support. Like the support is what keeps you to a community. And if you don't have that support, whether that be socially or professionally or emotionally, then you're out of here, you know? I know, I think about that a lot. Like, I guess I think about it in terms of like, when I was in Spain, for example, you know, it's like, I didn't, I didn't go to Spain. I wasn't like trying to mix it up. Like I just got to go and live there and benefit from their nice infrastructure and, and all these things And and I only did it for a year. Um, and at that time, I remember towards the end of that experience feeling eager to get back. I had a contract to teach a second year, but I felt like my cup was full and I had had a really restorative year and I was like, okay, I'm ready to take everything I learned during my service term and kind of take all this rest and kind of go back to Baton Rouge. And I felt recharged and I was eager to kind of get some things shaking and moving and stuff. But yeah, I want so much more for this city. I really do. And for everybody who lives here. Well, we're getting into like the final descent of the interview and I want to make sure it ends not on a false positive note, but on a constructively positive note. Like we understand that there's so much to do, but I don't want to leave with this feeling of there's really nothing we can do. So I guess the question I have for you, first of all, is relevant to your current work with Serve Louisiana. You know, based on what you're telling me, you do a lot of collaborations with nonprofits. You know, it's to my understanding that core members collaborate with nonprofits with these these 11 month, you know, assignments how they work to give their talents and their skills to these nonprofits. And I'm sure that you all have goals to develop and deepen relationships with those you've already worked with, but what are some other kind of nonprofits that you'd like to support with Serve Louisiana in the future? Something that I really like about our current grant is that we're really most interested in supporting new organizations that are just kind of starting out um, so that they can really launch and and get their work going. Um, We have seen a huge uptick in organization. We have a ton of positions that are addressing environmental issues and that started in the last five years. And I think that's going to continue to trend that way just because of the climate crisis and with Louisiana being on the front line of that. In the past couple of years, we've had more organizations that are specifically serving immigration, immigrant populations. And I, I have a personal interest and connection with that work. Um, and that's something I'm passionate about. Um, we have core members that work in, within criminal justice reform work. I think that's really impressive and important and you know, really important work. I mean, the thing that's hard with Louisiana is it's like, there are so many pressures on our families. It's all important work. (laughs) And so, um, and there's a lot to get done and to get done simultaneously, really, because it's, you know, it's hard to build some sort of hierarchy of like what, 
which issue takes precedent. I mean, they're all very pressing issues. Maybe just seeing how these issues intersect, because I think that there are a lot of issues that overlap that can create fertile ground for collaboration, like climate change and racism. You know, oh, yeah. about, like I know plenty of organizations in the river parishes that are doing a lot of organizing against like, you know, chemical plants and refineries and other plants that are oh, yeah. messing up the environment. And those parishes are mostly, if not exclusively, African-American. And that yeah. intersection is important. Oh, it's very important. And I think, you know, we have part of our programming is every month we have a different issue that we look at with the core members. And we look at not only the issues, but like I was saying earlier, who's working to address those issues. And each core member at the beginning of the service term will pick one or two team meetings that they want to help plan and facilitate. And so last year we had a team working on an environmental team meeting. And part of that team meeting included, we had Ms. Sharon from Rye St. James join us and talk about their work in St. James Parish. And yeah, and hearing her talk was really, I mean, she is an incredibly impressive captive speaker and her work is super important. Her I mean, even talking about like listening to her talk about her own development, I think was incredible. I know it was incredible for me. I think it was incredible for the core members because she talked about how she was a teacher, you know, and then when she was 65, she basically started organizing. She didn't even know what organizing was. And, but she just has like this really strong intuition um, when it comes to organizing. And, and now she's getting all this support, national support, national recognition for her work. And she's making incredible strides. And of course, it's not just Ms. Sharon. I mean, there's a lot of people working alongside her, but Rye St. James is doing really impressive work um, with the Bucket Brigade and some other organizations in the area. But we really do try to bring that to the forefront for our core members so that they can make those connections and kind of understand how it all intersects during their service term. And that they know that they're not going to do all the work, all the things at once. You know, there's so much happening. I think the other thing is a lot of times when we bring in um, guest speakers, you know, we have so many folks who've been doing this work for a really long time. And I do think it's a really powerful message for our core members, especially. We don't have an age cap, but the vast majority of them are like in their 20s and 30s. And, you know, for them to hear from somebody who's in their 60s and they describe what it's like you know, and they've been doing the work for a long time. Um, you know, how do you keep your joy and how do you, how do you do this work and not let it totally consume you and strike a balance? And yeah, I mean, there's like big lessons in there for sure. Yeah. And I think another thing that is important about, about that, those like things you do with like the Speaker, the speaker series and just engaging with the community is showing the core members that there have been people who have been doing this work for a while. So don't think that nothing is happening. Well, exactly. And that's what I, you know, that is one of the biggest things to me is because um, especially criminal justice is an issue that every year the core members want to talk about prison reform, criminal justice reform. And um you know, and we will invite a variety of perspectives, even within the criminal justice reform community. I mean, making sure that we have people who are explaining, you know, the importance of centering abolition, like there should be no prisons in that in that idea and that that goal. Um, but also and also having organizations who say, yes, that's the goal. And this year we worked really hard. And we were able to pass this legislation at a state level to protect pregnant women from solitary confinement. I have heard people say like, oh, you know, that's so absurd that that has to be done or that's so small or something. And it's like, it's important work. And you just like, you get it done how you can. And, and you know, within our team meetings and our uh, professional developments that we have for the core members, we really do try to highlight a lot of the strides that have been made. I, one thing I would love to see more are organizations embracing global citizenship because oftentimes I think that because we live in a state with such a rich, unique culture and because we live in a state that's kind of isolated in a way from the rest of the world, we, um, 
in terms of our culture, our practices, we're very different from the rest of America. We kind of get caught up in our in what's in what's only in our parish or what's only in the 64 parishes, not realizing that the world is so much bigger than just where we live. And that's like one of the things that A21 has been trying to do, showing global citizenship is not just about traveling and getting your passport stamped, but simply about understanding that some of the issues you're experiencing here in your community are issues that we are collectively experiencing worldwide, which means that there are so many ways that we all can learn from each other and also ways that we could be more cognizant of our differences and appreciating those differences because we don't live in the world by ourselves and we can't operate in the world by ourselves. So I would love to see more local nonprofits thinking more about their place, not only in their local community, but also in the global community, because there are some projects that are happening in one part of the world that could be implemented and modified for the community. Mm -hmm. And there are other things that, you know, other, you know, organizations in Louisiana that focus specifically on that global connectedness that Louisiana has through its business, its tourism, and its and it's trade that other organizations like yours could benefit from. Like maybe having people from different organizations that focus on like foreign affairs or business or global social justice movements, like with climate change and and with um and refugee resettlement that all yeah. could be of good use. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you said refugee resettlement at the end. I mean, that to me is huge. Um, and there's like very strong connections between Louisiana and that issue for sure yeah historical and current i mean yeah. there i mean with there's with all the stuff that's going on in afghanistan you know there's an article i read from the advocate that talked about there that we are getting you mm-hmm. know a handful of Af- afghan refugees and also four ethnic groups of were refugees like the vietnamese americans and he came as refugees from vietnam when the war ended so Understanding that and having organizations kind of think outside and within simultaneously, I think it's very important. Yeah. Definitely. Last question I have. Well, last question and a half, because I have another question that I want to ask you, but it's a but you'll kind of see where I'm going with this. You're involved in a lot, you do a lot. We've spent a lot of time talking about Surf Louisiana, but I want to recognize that you also play a very pivotal role in together Baton Rouge, and you've been with Dialogue on Race for almost a decade. So you have a lot that you've done and and a lot that you are engaged in and probably a lot you want to be engaged in. So what, how do you want the community to see you, seeing that you're so involved? Like, how do you want the community to see you as an organizer, as a leader? I would want to be seen as someone who is um, committed to building relationships and identifying common interests so that when our interests align, we can get something done. That might not be all the time. We might not always agree, but where we do and when we do, like, let's work on that. Let's, let's fix it. Let's get it done. Um, I'd also want to be seen as someone who's really committed and dedicated. I think a lot of the work with Serve Louisiana, Dialogue on Race, and Together Baton Rouge, um, All of that is about like laying a strong foundation. With Serve Louisiana, we're developing leaders and I'm really investing in each and every core member every year. They might not get deep and rooted in their community work for five or 10 years down the road, just like I didn't as a core member. You know, I was a core member in um, 2012. So um, here I am almost 10 years later. And so I think... You know, same with Dialogue on Race. Every year I do facilitate multiple series um, because I really believe in that curriculum and the structure of that dialogue and how it's set up. I think it's really transformative. And I think it has the potential to really change so much. Together Baton Rouge, we will work on issues I mean, some issues we've been working on for years since we started as an organization, making, again, strides and having wins along the way. But it's it's really I'm really committed to all these organizations. I mean, I really believe in their missions. 
so I think that commitment and dedication to this work, you know, I've been around for a minute, so I guess I would want to be seen. You're not new to this. You're true to this. That's right. Not new to it. I'm true to it. Yeah. So last question, because obviously, you know, you've had to hustle to get to where you are. That's that's involved a lot of jobs. That's involved a lot of volunteering. That's involved a lot of interviews. And one thing that I don't want to happen is for you to leave this conversation feeling like you didn't get to express everything you wanted to express about your work, about yourself, or, or you to feel like you misrepresented yourself in any way. So I wanted to ask you before we end, you know, is there anything that you wanted to say that you wanted to either clarify or maybe add on to or anything or any words you wanted to say to kind of end the conversation. So that way it ends on a note and ends in a way that you that you want and what you like. Yeah, I'll say this about Serve Louisiana. I think Serve Louisiana as an AmeriCorps program is a really great springboard for people who are fiery and passionate and haven't figured out yet how to channel that, where to channel it. A service term can expose a person to so many different issues that we have in Louisiana that we're facing in Baton Rouge and in New Orleans and Lafayette. And I just think it's a great way to kind of get introduced to community work and working in the nonprofit sector and to get experience. Um, And I highly recommend it to anyone who is trying to figure out what to do, whether you're in between jobs, coming out of school, having graduated, coming out of school, having not graduated, you know, I, I do want to take advantage of the opportunity to spread the word that this organization exists and that we're eager to we invite you to imp- apply and come be a part of it. And it's, I think it's a really great way to kind of get started or continue your journey. Cause a lot of our core members bring so much to the table already, so much knowledge and experience and, and, uh, but it's a nice space to develop in because it's 11 months. It's there's room to make mistakes. Um, there's a lot of support and mentorship, both from Serve Louisiana, but also the partner organization where the person's serving. And I think it goes, I think that goes a long way. I think that support goes a long way. How can people join Serve Louisiana as a core member? How do they, how do they, how does the process work? Yeah. So we have um every spring we accept applications for the following fall, our service term is from September 1st to July 31st. The application is usually open in late spring and we'll announce our partner organizations in late spring. So every year we have different organizations that we partner with. We have different positions that are available. And so, yeah, I mean, the best way too is just to set up a meeting with me once you apply or if you're thinking about applying and I'm always eager to meet with people and hear what they're interested in and see what we can get them connected to. and how, you know, the community and that organization specifically can have a mutually beneficial setup. And how can organizations apply or be in touch with you all to be partner organizations? Because there may be someone who 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 would like to have core core members. Um, Yeah, partner organizations apply in March of every year. So again, it's just uh, like, in spring, early spring, we open up the partner organization application. Uh, you can set up a meeting with us, servlouisiana.org. Check it out. I'm always available to answer questions. Our executive director, Lisa, usually handles the partnership side of things. And I head up the, um, the search for potential core members and go through that application process with the core members and um, applicants. But Yes, partner organizations can come to us in the spring too. All righty. Well, y'all have it here, listening or watching. That's your, those are your marching orders. Please support Serve Louisiana. Um, I definitely will encourage people to be core members and organizations to join because I yeah. feel like the greater the network, the more impactful the work can be. <laughs>